the Lord a praise offering this morning. He is abundantly worthy of all of our praise. Thank you for your generosity this morning. Thank you for your investment in God's kingdom. I've got a word for you this morning. It's a word that I have shared with you in the last several weeks, and it is catch the fire. Fire of God has fallen. It's not falling. It's not coming. It has arrived. It's here. And I pray that your heart is set aflame in the presence and in the glory of Almighty God. And I'm grateful that God's glory, God's fire, isn't relegated to an emotion or to a service, to a day, but God's fire emanates within our life every single day. I live within the fire of God. And it's time to experience fire in our worship. Now you can say amen at Brazewood. It won't hurt my feelings at all. It's time to experience a fire in worship. It's time to walk in the fire of the Holy Spirit anew in our life. Every day I pray, and I can't think of anything more appropriate, that in the course of the end of this year, we're very close now to the end of 2022, that if you've not been baptized in the, in the Holy Spirit, that you would begin to earnestly and ardently seek the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life. And if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, I say to you, like Paul said to Timothy, fan into flame, fan into fire the Holy Spirit in your life. Let him rule and reign each and every day. And it's time to revive the fire of our first love. The Bible talks about that, and especially in end times, in the book of Revelations, dealing with the churches. It deals with one of the churches and says, I have this against you, you've lost your first love. In other words, we might say, you've allowed the fire to, to dwindle in your spirit. And I want to encourage you, fan into flame that fire of the Holy Spirit in your life. Let it glow, let it burn brightly within everything that you do. We find this in the scripture. In Leviticus chapter 6, verse 13, something very interesting at the building of the tabernacle, at the dedication of the tabernacle, at the, at the altar of the tabernacle, there was something that God prescribed. In other words, he demanded of the children of Israel. And that was this, Leviticus 6, 13, fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually, never let it go out. You read that again. Leviticus 6.13, fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. Now, in the Old Testament, the tabernacle represented the presence of God. In the New Testament, they built the temple, or excuse me, in the Old Testament, towards the end, they built the temple, the temple of David. And, and in the temple, the Bible declared, it was prescribed by God, that on the altar of sacrifice, the fire must never go out. A perpetual fire to be burning. And I believe with all of my heart that now we don't worship in a tabernacle made of brick and mortar. We worship in the tabernacle of our spirit, of our heart. And I believe that God is saying, as he did to Moses in the earthly tabernacle, he would say to the tabernacle of our spirit, never let the fire go out. But stoke that fire, give it fuel to burn, and burn consistently within our heart. Don't allow the fire on the altar of your life to ever go out. Which also means that in the tabernacle, they had to attend to the fire. They had to give fuel to the fire continually, otherwise it would go out. If you have a fire in your fireplace, unless it's a gas fire, as I have in my house, we just turn on a little nozzle, light it, and it stays lit for as long as there's gas. But if you have a regular fire, you've got to add fuel to that fire. If you put logs on the fire, you've got to make sure that you continuously put logs on the fire. And if you cease to do that, the fire will go out. Well, in our heart, in our life, in our spirit, if we want the fire of God to burn radiantly within our life, we, as children of God, have to be willing to add fuel to that fire. There's something that we must do in our life, and that's what I want to share with you this morning. What do we do to stoke the fire of God within our heart and life. It's time to dive deep and to catch the fire of God. Today we discover believers catch fire when they become desperate for God. I pray that we get that in our spirit this morning. The fuel to the fire of the Holy Spirit in our life is desperation. 
a desperation for God. Fire is revealed to the ones who are unfailingly desperate seekers of God, who unfailingly, unswervingly seek the fire of God within their life. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 says, Those who are hungry and thirsty to be right with God are happy because they will be filled. When you have that desperation, when you come to the realization that the only answer to the very needs of your life is God, the only answer to the desperation of life is God, the only answer to any question, challenge that we may face is God. Until we come to that moment, we cease to add fuel to the fire. In the message version it says, you are blessed when you work up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best in the best meal you'll ever eat. I like that. you got to work up an appetite, a good appetite for the things of God. This type of desperation is what births the authentic fire. And it is a craving within our spirit. It's a longing within our life. It's a thirst and an ache that nothing can satisfy other than God. Nothing can satisfy the ache, the longing, the craving. It's a passion for something fresh, fresh manna, if you will. It's a passion for something that's real. It's a passion for something new, something deep within our spirit and our life. It's not something that comes in a can or in a sermon or in the pastor or even in a song. Not something, this desperation this craving, this longing for God, not things, but God, is something that does not come easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. It may not even be convenient. But how many of you know that thresh, uh, thirst, that longing, isn't usually convenient? This is not a microwave religion. I remember when microwaves first came out. They were huge. They were this big, and and the big thing was you can bake a tur- uh, excuse me you can bake a potato that fast. That was a selling point to the microwave. You can bake a potato that fast. Well, in our family, we didn't eat a lot of potatoes all the time, but we wanted a microwave. I remember when I do- bought Donna our first microwave, and I'm telling you, it was huge. The thing was huge. It was this big and this wide. You you could you could get inside of it if you wanted to. It was huge. It was big. And, and it did bake potatoes and heat up leftovers. And that's about all we ever used it for. But it made things happen quickly. Quicker than we had in the oven or the stove. It could boil water quicker than you could on the stove. It could do so many things quicker and faster. It was convenient. But I want to tell you something. God is not limited by our convenience. God's timetable is not on our convenience. Our God is not a microwavable God. He's a God that requires, desires intimacy with his children. It's not something that can come easy, but something that can only originate from God. And there can be no fakes, no knockoffs, no seconds. Nothing that takes the place of the authentic fire of God. It's a desperation that you just have to itch. It's a desperation of an itch that you have to scratch. Have you ever had that? We were in California one day. They were having a work at the church and I was there. I was, I was a little guy. Not, well, little. I was never little, but about, um, I don't know, 10 years old, 11 years old. And while the men were working a couple of us kids, we were playing around. Our church in California was on the side of a mountain, and um, so and it was it wasn't um, wasn't developed a lot of development there, some but not a lot. And so we as kids, we we were a couple of us just running around out in the on the mountain, running around, and we decided that we were going to go camping or pretend that we were camping. And so in our camping, we decided we need to get some food, fake food. And so we gathered together what we thought were leaves and made a salad. We didn't eat it, but you know, we were pretending. Well, little did I know that it was poison ivy. 
And about two days later, I had poison ivy all over my body, literally, almost every inch, in my face, hair, everywhere, because I'd handled that poison ivy, the oil got on my hands, and, and, and I got to tell you, it was an itch I had to scratch. Anybody, anybody have poison, allergic to poison ivy? You know what I'm talking about. Those little blisters come up and you, you got to scratch them. You know you shouldn't. You know it's only going to get worse if you do, but you got to scratch them. Well, this hunger, this thirst, this desperation for God is like that. It's something that you got to do. It's something that nothing can take the place of. We put calamine lotion all over me. Didn't help. Didn't help one bit. I suspect now they have, they have um, different medications that you can take. But back in the day, back in the good old days, they didn't have any of that stuff. This calamine lotion didn't, didn't do much of anything. It, it's, it's a desperation. It's an itch you have to scratch. And that is for the things of the Lord. The desperation begins and births that authentic fire. And it, it, it's an insatiable desire for more and more of God. We've tasted. We, we've, we've sat down at the table of the presence of the Lord and we have consumed His goodness. We've consumed His glory and it just gives us an appetite for more and more and more. Psalms 42 verse 1, A deer thirst for the streams of water. In the same way, David said, I thirst for God. Psalm 63, 1, you, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water. You get the sense of the desperation that David had for the presence of the Lord. First time we were in Nigeria, first travel. We've been there four, five, six times, I don't recall. First time we were there, we had ministered different areas of, of Lagos and beyond. And when it was time to go, we got to the airport early. And, and remember, we were we were youngsters back then and didn't have a lot of sense. And we got to the airport maybe about four or five hours early. And uh, at that time at the airport in Lagos, there was very little to do except sit. And so we sat. And I became thirsty. And it's a thirst like I've never had in my life before. And I, I didn't know where to find water. I guess there's water all over the place, but I didn't know where to find it. And so I sat there and sat there for about four hours thirsty. Started thirsty. It just got worse and worse and worse. Finally, we were able to board the plane, and I sat down, and I told Donna, I said, I can't, I can't handle this anymore. I've got to have some water. And so I went back to the flight attendants in the back of the plane, and I said, could, could I, I'm, I'm, I haven't had water in, I think, three days, <laughs> and, and, and I'm, I'm thirsty. I, I, could I have some water, please? And she said, oh, yes, sir, no problem. And she got one of those little bitty plastic cups. You know what they serve on the airplane. Little bitty plastic cup. She filled, filled it up with water. And I looked at that and I thought, this ain't going to do it. I didn't tell her that, but thought to myself, this ain't going to do it. Because I'm from Texas and we say ain't a lot. So I went back to my seat and, and I savored. I, I sipped it so very slow. But I didn't help. Finally, I gulped it down. And I was as thirsty then as I was, then as I was before. So I went back to the flight attendant again, and she looked at me like, now what do you want? And I said, I, I thank you for the water. I appreciate that so much, but I am so thirsty. I haven't had water in a long time, and I'm really, it's almost a point where I'm, I'm, I'm famished. I'm starving. My body is starving for water. And she looked at me, and then grace and mercy covered her face. And she got one of those big bottles of water and gave me the whole bottle. I put that under my arm and I walked back to my seat. I sat down, opened that bottle, and I chugged almost the whole thing, which creates other issues that we'll, we'll not talk about today. But it, it, I have never in my life been that thirsty, truly. Never in my life been that thirsty. That's the kind of thirst the Holy Spirit spoke to me. That's the kind of thirst that we must have for the things of God. And not just the things of God, but the presence and the glory of God. Nothing takes the place, no thing, no provision, nothing takes the place of the presence of God in our life. A casual seeker will never experience the authentic fire of God. I want to say that again. 
A casual seeker will never experience the authentic fire of God. And I'm not talking about sinners. I'm talking about believers. Believers who have been distracted in their faith. Believers who love the Lord, but but they have appetite for other things as well. Now, here's the thing. When you have a desperate appetite for God, it doesn't mean that other things have no importance at all. What it means is there are priorities. And I want you to know, when you have a priority for the presence of God, He'll take care of everything else. When you're desperate for Him in your life, desperate to know Him, to seek Him, to discover Him, to revel in His glory, when you have that kind of appetite, you don't have to worry about the rest of it. He'll take care of everything else because He desires that kind of intimacy with us. One can get cozy and lazy in faith and practice of religiosity and spiritual matters and start to feel ordinary, start to feel routine, obligatory, or even the things of God become mundane. When our appetites are satisfied with the things of this world, with distractions, it appeases the appetite that we have for God. When we start, when we become satisfied with the things as they are, when we look back more than we look ahead, when we place our trust in what we see, what we know, or what we're told, we will never catch fire. I want to repeat that. When we become satisfied with the way things are, we're talking spiritually here. When we become satisfied with the way things are, we do things out of road, we do things out of obligation, we do things out of tradition. When we look back more than we look ahead, when we look back at the revivals of the past instead of looking forward to what God desires to revive today, when we place our trust in what we see, We place our trust in our eyes, our senses. When we place our trust in what we know, our intellect. When we place our trust in what we are told by others. We have a relationship with God through the pastor, through the teacher, through our parents, through somebody else. Instead of having our own personal relationship with the Lord, we will never catch fire. This desperation is not birthed out of discontentment discontentment with the way things are. Rather, this desperation is birthed from the knowledge that God is good. It's a desperation of tasting and see that God is good, but knowing that there's more of God's goodness to discover. This desperation, it grows because I want more of the presence. I desire, I need more of the presence of God in my life. It's a, it's a growing appetite. I need more of the presence of God, an acknowledgement that I have not arrived yet. I am not where I need to be. I'm not where God wants me to be. I'm arriving. It's a journey. I'm getting there, but I'm not there yet. My brother and sister, as long as there's breath in your body, you are not there yet. There's more to know. There's more to discover, more to experience of the Lord. And I have discovered there is more of God's presence to experience. How quickly God responds to the desperation, the desperate cry of his children. How quickly You don't have to beg God. You don't have to plead with God. You don't have to bribe God. God quickly responds to the desperate cry of his children. Just as an earthly parent responds to the cry of their children. And by the way, you know, if you have children, you know there are different types of cries that children have. There's a cry of frustration. There's a cry of anger. And there's a cry of desperation. A cry of anger may not evoke a quick response from a parent. A cry of pain will probably evoke some sense of response. But when you hear that desperate cry that only a mother and father recognizes, when you hear that desperate cry, don't get in the way of that parent because they'll mow you down getting to their child. That's the way God is. When he hears that desperation in our heart, our spirit, that desperate cry of our prayers, of our intercession, that desperate cry that he emits from the spirit that desires and hungers and thirsts after God, he will quickly respond and bring that revelation. Vance Harvner said, those who are desperate enough to know him, seek him, and obey him will find themselves enjoying a richer and fuller life in Christ. And I'll conclude with this. 
Psalms 34, verse 4 through 8 in the message version says this, God met me more than halfway. (laughs) I love that. God met me more than halfway. I, I like to think of it this way. When I cry out to God, he's already on his way. In fact, when I cry out to God, he's already there. He freed me from my anxious fears. Look at him. Give him your warmest smile. Never hide your feelings from him. When I was desperate, I called out, and God got me out of a tight spot. God's angels set up a circle of protection around us while we pray. And then the message version says it this way. Open your mouth and taste. Open your eyes and see how good God is. Blessed are you who run to the Lord. Because remember, the casual seeker will never experience the fire of God. The casual seeker who is satisfied with the things of this world, satisfied with the distractions of this world, will never experience the radiant fire of God. And when we become desperate for God, then we will catch the fire. When we become desperate for God. So really, What I'm saying is, it's not God's responsibility. It's mine. If I'm going to light the match, God has already had the fire. And as we said in stewardship, the fire is already in God's hand. The fire is already in God's word. The fire is already in God's eyes. It's there. But when we become desperate, we become longing, craving the presence of the Lord, it's the smile of God that releases that fire into our heart and our spirit. And then like the fire on the altar of sacrifice, never again let it go out. Stay hungry for the Lord. And when we catch the fire, God will reveal his glory to each and every one of us. When that authentic fire begins to burn, you will see God in a new and a vibrant way. So here's our challenge. Our challenge this morning is catch the fire. To become desperate for the authentic fire of God. Hunger for more. Acknowledge that you need more. And then commit an eternal commitment to discover that there is more of God to discover in our life. And to those who may not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, hearing this talk about fire, radical transformation of life, and wondering, how can I receive that? How can I... How can I have that in my own life? It comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you surrender your life to God, that's when the fire begins. That's the birthing of the fire of God. And then we begin, as I've said, we begin to add fuel to that fire in our life. I ran across this the other day and I share it with you. And especially for those of you that do not have a personal daily relationship with the Lord. No matter how long you have traveled in the wrong direction, you will always have a choice to turn around. And today, you can turn to Jesus. Today, you can turn the very course of your life from destruction, pain, anguish. You can turn your life over to Jesus. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, he stands willing and ready to forgive you and to bring you into his family. And the Bible says that it's not just God who changes and transforms our life, but that he is with us always. Every battle... Every challenge, every crisis, every need, he is right there with you. And he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And he said, from that moment on that you commit your life to Christ and pray that prayer of forgiveness from that very moment, he said, I'll be with you until you are with me. Isn't that beautiful? He will be with me until I am with him. Amen. So I want to encourage you. First Peter chapter 1 says, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for. Every head bowed and every eye closed. And every believer praying in this service this morning on campus, there may be those that don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Not about tradition, not about religion, not about church membership. It is a personal relationship with Jesus. And that comes not because of what we do, but by what he has already done. He gave his life. He sacrificed himself to ransom us from the sin and decadence and pain, ransom us into the family of God, adopted us into his family. And it comes when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Pastor Steve, what do I have to do to be saved? Call on the name of the Lord. That's what the Bible says. Call on the name of the Lord. You don't have to join. You don't have to pay. All you have to do is come to the Lord 
and ask him to forgive you and ask him to change your life, to transform your life. And with a simple prayer, simple prayer, not by the eloquence of our words, not by the number of words that we speak, but the simplicity of our heart, simply asking to be forgiven, asking for that relationship. The Bible says he's faithful and just and will forgive us of all of our sins. And then cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, change our life. If you're here this morning on campus and you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, perhaps as we've been talking about the fire, there's something within your heart that says, that's what I want in my life. That's what I need in my life. I've settled for the fake. Now I want the real thing. If you're here this morning and you do not have a personal relationship with Christ and you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or online and you don't have that personal relationship, playing the game, being a member, having all the knowledge but no relationship, today's your day. The Bible says today is a day of salvation. And so I'm going to ask, if you're here this morning and you need to be forgiven of sin, you're here this morning and you need transformation in your life, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand, wave at me because I want to pray with you this morning because this is your day. Thank you. Thank you. Others, just wave. I, want to, I, want, I don't want to miss anybody because this is my opportunity to pray for you. And I'm honored to pray. Anybody else? Thank you for those that have made that confession of faith. And now we're going to pray. And I want you to repeat this prayer. And it's, it's more than just repeating a prayer. It's taking ownership of the words that are spoken and then believing that God will do something great. Pray with me. Everyone in this room, pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, today, December 11th, 2022, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of every wrong I have ever done in my life. And because you have forgiven me now, I ask you to change my life. Give me a life worth living. Give me this fire that your word speaks of. And I accept that today, because of this prayer, offered in honesty. I am a child of God. I am your child and I'll never be the same again. And I receive that by faith. I receive that trusting you. In Jesus name. Amen. And amen. Give the Lord a praise offering. This is the beginning of the fire. And not only when we begin to desire more and crave more of the presence of God, but when we begin to realize that this is what the kingdom is all about, people coming to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. My brother and sister, for those of you that made that decision on campus or online, God heard your prayer, God has answered your prayer, and now you have a new beginning, and God will be with you always. Our charge